I want to bring in someone who can help us make sense of this. He is Sean Egan of Even Jones Rating Agency. Sean was ranked as one of the number one strategists by Forbes for calling the market decline in 08. He also downgraded the U.S. several weeks before S&P. Sean, great to have you on the show. Make sense of these headlines for us. Why would Europe increase its lending facility by fivefold? Well, Adam, this is the uh, shock and awe approach. Uh, increasing it by fivefold supposedly should give some comfort to some of the investors that there will be the resources to solve this problem. The, pro the offset, however, is a substantial increase in the credit risk for those parties giving the support, that is, the France and Germany's of the world, whereby their exposure increases to a level that uh, is likely to impact their credit rating. And why is that? Because they're going to have to write a larger check? Is that why? Well, they're structuring it as a guarantee. So uh, initially, they won't have to come up with the money, but the exposure is there. And if there are some significant write downs on the sovereign credits, which we expect, and the attendant banks, then somebody's going to have to come up the money, uh, with the money for that. And at the front of the line will be Germany and France. Bear in mind that Germany's total debt is about 1.4 trillion, and if you're talking about the total fund size of 2 trillion, and their portion being, let's say, about 20 percent, that's a substantial amount of exposure to take on. What's not being written about is what terms are going to be used for uh, laying out money and guarantees, well, let's put it in the broad category of support by the EFSF, and they'll be worked out over time. Sean, your clients ask you a lot about European banks at this point. Are you getting a lot of customers saying, is now the time to buy and asking you for research based on that? Europe has been the main event. Uh, there is a major article in Barron's as of July whereby we were bearish on the European banks. They declined between 40 and 75 percent since that article. The, uh, the crisis has changed, though, and uh, so the, the parties that lost before, the banks that lost before, are different now, and you have to do some pretty detailed research to find out what the next leg is going to look like, and that's what we're involved in right now. You know, Sean, one of the interpretations of this might be if they have to increase this fund fivefold, it might actually be a lot worse than we thought. Does that enter into your calculations at all? Well, you have to. The news over the past year and a half is that with each iteration, it has been much worse. Uh, people thought originally Greece wasn't going to default because it's a member of the EU. Then it might default, but the haircut would be fairly minimal. Now it's that they're definitely going to default, and the haircut is north of 50 percent. I think that there's some obvious need of support, and, and hopefully this will help, but there is going to be some pushback. Ultimately, it might be the taxpayers that are on the hook for this rather than the creditors that made the dumb credit decisions. Sean, yesterday, Moody's put out its annual review of France. It wasn't a ratings action. They did, though, say that their AAA rating stands, that it reflects the strength of the, of the country. But they did have a big however within that report. What do you make of today's news? Do you see Moody's going back, perhaps, and now putting the, this country or as a sovereign credit on watch? They certainly should. We don't have France at a AAA. We didn't see that there any way in the world that either France or Germany should be a AAA because of the very thing that we're talking about, that is that they have substantial exposure to the other EU countries and their banks. Uh, this is going to cause us to revisit France and Germany's credit rating, and it's unlikely that we're going to take a positive action. It's going to impact not only the sovereign ratings, but all the banks underneath the various countries. You know, Sean, part of the commentary coming out of Europe is that this EFSF, which now could be $2 trillion, may issue some AAA-rated bonds. But if, in fact, it's being funded by companies like France that might have their own rating cut, does that undermine the legitimacy of a AAA rating for the EFSF? There's no question, Adam. Uh, there's a big difference between funding a unit with cash, which is not happening here as a guarantee, and then looking at the underlying support of those parties that supposedly are giving the cash. Spain and Italy are part of the funding for the EFSF, and it's unlikely that they're going to be able to contribute a substantial amount of cash to support the EFSF. 
Well, we have a market mismatch. As you look at some of the big banks, Bank of America, Citi, J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, take your pick. Look at this. The stocks are up, and so are the credit default swaps. What's going on here? In other words, you can't have the equity investors as optimists saying that they like stocks and that there's less risk when, in fact, the credit default swaps traders are saying we think there's more risk. You can't have both going up at the same time. We're joined once again by Sean Egan of Egan Jones. Sean, I'm glad you're here to help us make sense of that. Why is it and who's right, equity investors or credit default swaps investors? It depends on the environment. I think in this environment where the main issue is a credit issue, very well be that maybe that the uh, credit investors are the, the longer term uh, investors and, and they might see some things that the equity side doesn't quite see yet. And, and what's, what's your take right now on the long term for the banks? Not necessarily today, tomorrow, but long term. How do you feel about the banks? Uh, the U.S. banks are just fine. The, they're having some difficulty now because of the flattening in the yield curve. If you look at Bank America's uh, net interest income, it's down. It's down for the simple reason that they're not able to charge as much. If you look at the nine-month figures, forget about the three months. There's too much distortion. But if you look at the nine months, it's very telling. I think it's down about $5 billion, uh, and that's something that they're going to have to deal with over time. The, there's a lot of noise in, on the credit side whereby they're having to pay more for their mortgage uh, uh, losses, litigation losses, and yet the bad debt is, is down. But the, I think that the real issue is really uh, on what the long-term net interest margin is going to look like. We think that the credit environment in the U.S. is improving, and so they, they should be fine over the long term. Hey, is it possible, Sean, that Operation Twist which effectively tries to flatten the yield curve, is ultimately hurting the banks? There's no question that that's the ultimate uh, effect on the banks. Um, hopefully, from a policy standpoint, is helping the mortgage market and making houses more affordable and getting that side. That's the intention, at least. But you're seeing some problems, short-term problems, in the bank. Goldman's issue is a little bit different. Uh, in the case of Goldman, there's the overhang from the Volcker rule, whether or not they're going to be able to deal with that, the, in, in, since trading is so important to that firm relative to the normal commercial banks. And if they step out of the uh, Volcker uh, was a regulation, whether or not they are going to have the credit quality to minimize their, their interest expense. I think that is going to be sorted out over the next 12 months. Goldman has a fantastic franchise. We took a slight negative action on them today because of the Volcker issue um, and also because you have those, some political overhang with the Occupy uh, Wall Street crowd. But over the long term, Goldman is in terrific shape. Hey, let me ask you, you talk about the overhang from the protesters, and you can understand how that affects the investment banks. Do, or does the protest movement affect the regional banks, the home lenders, in any way from your point of view? I don't think they're the primary target. I think the, the uh, thing that sticks in the craw of most people involved in Occupy Wall Street is all this money has been given to the major commercial banks, and yet they uh, receive substantial bonuses while many people are losing their homes. And I think there's a disconnect. The, the problem with Occupy Wall Street is that their efforts aren't very focused. Uh, they have rejected the Republican Party, rejected the Democratic Party. It's hard to set up a third party. So it's difficult to gain real political traction over the short term. Uh, nonetheless, uh, you know, it, it's covered in the news and, and it's uh, Goldman and the other major banks remain in the sights of, uh, of that crowd. All right, Sean Egan, founder of Egan Jones, we thank you for being on the show. Always a pleasure to have your perspective. Remember, Sean Egan ranked number one strategist by Forbes for calling the markets back in 08.